you so much. One more time for the panel. Here. I'm sure we heard Agricoles and Côte d'Ivoire just to clarify. Agricoles in French is Côte d'Ivoire, you know, the ivory of the elephant. It used to be very populated with elephants before the colonial masters came and killed all the elephants. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. Um, this is the time for the Q&A session. Questions and answers, if you have any comments, any suggestions, any opinions on how to move forward so we can change politics and the policies towards Africa. This is time to do it. What can I help? Yeah, uh, and I'm asking this question to any one of the pan uh, panelists can answer it. I've been following actually the um, event in uh, Côte d'Ivoire through the French news, uh, which I recently did. And um, there's one thing they keep talking about, uh, ethnicity. There's a difference in ethnicity. Could somebody, I, I understand that you know the northern part is mostly Muslim and the, the southern part is mostly Christian. Uh, if could somebody explain you know about ethnicity difference in ethnicity in uh, Cote d'Ivoire? Yeah, you're right. Because uh, in fact we have uh, 63 different ethnic groups in Cote d'Ivoire. Some people will say 66 or a difference. 63 is the, uh, the one which is well known by everybody. And the major groups, in fact, when we try to group them, is, uh, is they made of Voltaic group, Malenke group, Mande Sud group, Kru, Labinaire, and Akam. So these uh, groups have subgroups. And for example, if you take the Akam, they're mostly those who are in the center, but also in the south because they migrated originally from Ghana. You have Baule, Ani, Atie, Ebrie, all those people who are in the south of the So if you, if you also take, for example, the Voltaic group, they're those who are sometimes by the border of uh, former Burkina, uh, uh, Upper Volta. And they are made of uh, uh, Lobi, uh, Kulango, uh, you know, that subs group in them. And you have the Malenke who are in the north. And they're made of, uh, uh, normally, this, they, they, some people will say you have in the Malenke, you have uh, people from Odine, Segela, uh, they call uh, Tawana, the northern part. There are many groups in them. And you have the, the crew uh, made of, uh, you know, in the east, uh, sorry, in the west, you have Bete, uh, Dida, many subgroups. So there are many different ethnic groups. But the thing is that they are somewhere interrelated. Because if you take, for example, the Mandane people and the Malenke, there is a connection somewhere. And this is something interesting, mostly, that could help for peace uh, resolution conflict, uh, conflict resolution. It is that there is through uh, multi, uh, I mean, weddings, uh, intermarriages, uh, multi-ethnic groups who get together. And usually, they're what we call alliance. They, they, parent, uh, they call it, uh, Parental jokes, as sometimes called alliances. That means certain group of uh, uh, ethnic groups have the right because they're linked through, uh, let's say, a long time they've been uh, have, doing marriages, getting together, so they can joke with the others. For example, if you take the the Yakuba and the Gere, they're all in the west side but they, of, the, of Cote d'Ivoire, the border of Liberia. They don't understand each other very well, but they're connected through history and they can easily mingle together. It's the same with the Senufo people who are said to be the first uh, people who came to Cote d'Ivoire in the north. They were a little bit down, but they've been pushed by the Baule when they were migrating. 
and the Senufo is a very big group, have that alliance with the Koyaka. And it's a kind of joking system where you don't have to get angry, you don't have to get cross. Anything, for example, it could be during a, a, a burial ceremony, and the one group can come and block the coffin and ask for uh, any reward, could be money, could be drugs and anything, before you could bury your, 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 your corpse. Mm -hmm. And it would take time. You, they have to negotiate, they have to do anything. So when you're a foreigner, you're really astonished and you say, what's going on? Why, why are they playing with something so serious? But it's the tradition. So this is something that exists across ethnic groups. So sometimes people say it's an African way that can help Africans to solve their conflict. If we consider that and teach this way to our children, we can easily get together. And also, as a part of the reconciliation, there should be more emphasis on the fact that there only one Ivory, because uh, the population has changed over the years. Even there are, um, in Ivory Coast, there are many foreigners that came from further, uh, like from Nigeria, uh, from many uh, other African countries that have been in Cote d'Ivoire for many years. Even they've been in Ivory Coast before the independence. So the settler, like in the United States, we, they have different ethnic groups, but they still, everyone is still considered um, American. So as, as a part of the reconciliation, they should focus on um, um, just being an Ivorian and uh, so that the people can be together. We have um, people from Lebanese and uh, Liban. We have so many people um, in Cote d'Ivoire, but uh, a lot of them were born there. And there have been intermarriages between all the different groups in Cote d'Ivoire. So if we see um, an Ivorian family, then we have connection with um, through marriages, mm -hmm. connection with the different ethnic group, um, Nigerian, that we have um, a Bauli um, wife or husband. <coughs> so the focus now should be on being an Alborian. Mm -hmm. And um, there should not be any discrimination among any um, group uh, based on the foreign background or the ethnicity. So, yeah, I just wanted to ask to add up something. In fact, the former president, Laurent Gbagbo, played on that. Yeah, because he had, uh, people say that he had three wives. His first wife was a French lady. He's an African. And his second wife is uh, from the south. She's uh, from Bassam. And his third wife is from the north. So when, during the first round of the presidential elections, the northern wife was the one who was leading because she has a, a communication company. She was the one leading uh, Babo's uh, e elections. Mm -hmm. And in the north, because he needed people of the north, because people of the north originally stand behind Alassane Ouattara. Mm -hmm. So what he did was that he, he got married to that wife, to that lady who is from the north. And he was using uh, her family, his, uh, her uncle, was uh, even the director of his campaign in the north. And his uh, cousin was, uh, uh, let's say, a uh, leader of youth union, who was standing for Gbagbo. So that was his strategy, and that's why people of the FPE, uh, people of political, uh, I mean, front, political front, were saying, if we cannot win uh, the north or other regions, we're going to win it through Intermarriages. That's what they were, well, they were using as strategy. And the problem of Cote d'Ivoire, in fact, is called is said to be an identity uh, problem, as he said. So that's exactly. Brother James, yeah, yeah, yeah. has has some uh, comments and suggestions. Uh, I'm going to do it real quick. Can be anybody in the panel. First thing I see, I actually was having a discussion about this on the way, it's tribalism. Tribalism, uh, which to me uh, is tantamount to racism. 
talking about in Africa. And when I looked at that as a black man in America, to see how African Americans in America is doing pretty much the same thing to each other, just a different skirt, a different hat, but it, it's the same thing. So how, so the question would be, how do you get all of the different tribes and the different thoughts and the different racism that's going on among black Africans to come together under one banner. In America, we call it black nationalism. That's the first thing. The second thing, um, uh, uh, as the, the image of Africa in America, that's very important because if you're asking Americans whether it's white or black to want to assist and help the situation over in America, how the, the image of Africans in America is very important. And now, now, now again, speaking as a, a black man in America, when you see uh, Africans coming over in different ways, whether it's refugees or whatever way that you come in through Im Im immigrating over here, um, and then you see that there is, there is uh, no inclusiveness of the black American to the African. Mm -hmm. There is no unity, there is no inclusion there's even sometimes no respect. And then how do you get uh, a black American, let's say, who want to just lend a hand? Me, I'm all for it, and that's why I'm here. But I just wanted to get this information out there because there is a schism and there's a division between Africans of all different tribes and different countries that come over to the black uh, man in America. We have descendants from Africa, but we're not seen as part of Africa. Okay, and then the other thing I want to get down to is you talk about leaders over in Africa. Where do their loyalties lie? Because the majority of the leaders that are in Africa, they're either educated in Germany, France, England, United States of America. They're put in power, and they can easily be taken out of power. And it would not surprise me that over in Egypt that there were some covert operatives over there that's planted inside that whole movement over there that got that going. Okay, so. Again, you know, these large companies like America, that com countries like America and France and all of that, are not just going to sit by and allow that type of a movement to go on. Like you just can't say, okay, you go march. I want Gaddafi to sit down. There's a lot more complex and complicated than than, than that. And then the other, then the, um, again, from my my experience with democracy here in America, from my studies, the first true democracy was actually came about through the, the, uh, the nation of Israel back pre-Christ pre days, back in biblical times. Today, in my opinion, democracy is an illusion. There is no true democracy. And I think democracy in any nation outside of America would be a mistake. Uh, because the more the, more the people, uh, colonialism as was talked about first uh, to, by your wife, colonialism is still prevalent all over Africa. And the more the people lose their identities and, and want to embrace Western cultures, European cultures, the more they easily can be easily overtaken and, and to be, be controlled. Self-determination only can happen if, if you stick to your roots and stick to your culture and, and stop trying to embrace other cultures. Because how, how African Americans were defeated and a lot of uh, African countries defeated. If you erase the history of a people, the people are lost. If, if you take away their, their religions, they're lost. If you take away their languages, they're lost. And this is what's happening all over the continent of America, and that America, Africa, and the people are fighting themselves. And as, as a suggestion, if anyone remembers um, Dr. Wangari Muta Matai from Kenya, the Green Belt Movement, I've watched that and I was completely blown away by that whole situation. It started with planting trees to bring back the country to its former state. And then it wound up when the whole government was toppled, she became elected to parliament. And I think it would be a good idea if maybe you, you, you include more brilliant African women who have courage and strength because some kind of way women have a more invested uh, 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 investedness in the people because the people come through the women. Yes. And I'm done.
those who don't know Brother, Brother James is also a minister. Anyone else know? I guess yes, this question. Um, first of all, the number one question is related to the previous question. Tribalism, ethnicity, yeah. pretty much will, um, a tribalism is more primitive language. So right. I will use ethnicity. Okay. And uh, it's pretty much the same thing. And uh, we answered that question before that um, because of the um, today's population in Arab coast, there's so many mixture, they, there should be less emphasis on the ethnicity. Right. And in order to have really reconciliation, we should try to um, avoid um, emphasis on the division among different group of people. Right. So I don't know if I answer your no, she should make you stronger. She make no, well, stronger. I was just simply saying. And uh, the African culture. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Did I call you? Hmm? The African culture, pretty much throughout Africa, we have the basic culture. We all have similar culture. And it's when, um, um, during the colonial period, we, they, they, they have been so many division among people that, um, um, they put more emphasis on uh, this is uh, this group, this is so so and so group, to the point that um, people they see that uh, they're different from one another. We all the same African people. We are all the same people. Exactly. But uh, sister, I'm, I'm hang on one minute. So, so we'll go. Thank you very much, and I would like to join everyone in thanking the panelists really very much for. Um, uh, these wonderful presentations. I just want to comment a little bit on um, some um, observations that were made by all families very, very quickly, and then pose a, a question that um, we might want to ask. I want to highlight the issue that um, our Sister Daya put to the table about the role of neocolonial leaders and their betrayal to the people, the mm -hmm. aspirations of the people, their collaboration, I, I'm expanding on, on what she was saying, their collaboration with imperialism, with capitalism in order to exploit the people, to do anything that enriches them, but just anything, do absolutely nothing that really empowers the people. People have had to grab the opportunity to empower themselves. So the role of your colonial leaders, this becomes extremely important because in a situation like we have right now, there has been a tendency to support one or the other of the, you know, of the two leaders. And lest we forget it, we are really looking at two neocolonial leaders who have betrayed in every way possible what Wilson was raising as these aspirations of the people. On the one hand, we have someone who really should have seen as somebody who should have defended um, independence and stuck to it and so on, but betrayed. Lorraine Babo, gone to the extent of impoverishing the cocoa farmers, mm -hmm. disempowering them completely, <coughs> you know, men, women, children, and so on, messing up the whole economy. I saw him just three days ago being defended very, very strongly by a Republican, one of the worst of the <laughs> Republicans, you know, um, in, 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 you know who, who was arguing that America should actually go and intervene and put him back into power after he was arrested on Monday. Mind you, I don't agree with the way that this was done because that's another narrative altogether. Um, but that's one. Then you have, on the other hand, you know, um, another one who literally is, you know, as somebody has put it, you know, the running errand boy for France. A person who was a part of the IMF, the World Bank, and mm -hmm. instituting the policies that again have put you know, the Ivory Coast in such a terrible place. That really we are looking at two you know, people who have no business leading the Ivory Coast in terms of what they have done. But you have people fighting for that, including intellectuals. And we had the same case in Kenya with Mike Baki and Oginga Odinga. I remember so graphically a seminar we had in, um, you know, at Syracuse University. 
And you have even people you consider progressive trying to defend ODM over KPU or defend KPU over ODM. And I told them, I said, these are two thugs. They are after power, both of them. And what we should be looking at are the people and the aspirations of the people. In fact, I'm not saying it behind their back because, uh, for instance, the Prime Minister, Oginga Odinga, is a friend of mine, and Mumbi and I were invited to meet him in Buffalo when he, was, he came there for graduation ceremony. Both of us were on the same platform being ordered, or honored as freedom fighters. <laughs> and I looked him eyeball to eyeball and said, what are you people doing? We were in the underground struggle together. What are you doing dividing the people, making them chop up one another? Involving little boys, you know, as we were being told, um, you know, by one of the speakers, you know, to fight in a war. That really, literally, children should not be um, involved in. So you have two evils here. And Baramusa said it and put it very powerfully when he said, "When you go and you confront both armies, you really don't know who is who." And that, to me, was very, very important. You know, about what we are trying to choose in between these. Which really brings me to the point that we also was making that is absolutely fundamental. Where are the people? What are the aspirations of the people? And what are we going to do in the peace process to make sure that people understand that power is in their hands? They are going to seize it and insist on controlling it. Which is one thing I'm very pleased about in Egypt because the people keep insisting, uh, even if the military takes over, we are not going to let you run over us. Yes, right. We want to take over and so on. There, there may be a problem in uh, people organizing themselves in order to take over. But this is what we should be defending, this is what we should be um, supporting. So I, I come now to my question because it was very, very well put by, um, you know, um, um, and uh, from the Peace Council, that we are talking about imperialism. Yeah. We are talking about power and the interest of corporate, the corporate what West, reason? America, and the world, and yeah. what they are building out there. They intervene when their interests are threatened. That's when they see the people and go to fight for the people. But before then, it looks as if the people are invisible. We have it going on right here, as um, and, and, and very well brought it up that really some of the illusions we are under about who can bring democracy and so on are just illusions. It's the people who have the power to make it happen. And we need to find out what are we going to do in this peace process in order to have people take the upper hand and determine what is going to happen. Because the AU has been sidelined and they should be very, very strong on the table doing this. But what can we do from this forum in order to intervene in such a way that we are getting away from focusing on the leaders and looking at what can be salvaged from the bottom for the people um, you know, in order to do this. Did you see any organizations on the ground when you were home what, where people are likely you know, to do this? The question of, of women are that disempowered people. And let, let, let me also suggest that we also analyze women very clearly in terms of their interest, in, class of, in terms of their class position. Because we've seen what is happening in Liberia. Mm -hmm. And we've seen women also join, you know, buy yeah. into patriarchy, into all these things. And so, so we are looking for progressive leadership, but it is true, women should be given a chance because sure. this has not happened. So what is happening in terms of women and youth and their involvement <laughs> in having this discourse that will bring to the fore the aspirations of the people. I think really that is so important. <laughs> is a problem because as you said uh, educated people uh, sometimes mislead those who are not educated and the problem usually is when they talk about social, social uh, civil societies people sometimes if you look at it is generally because in Cote d'Ivoire there's a discrepancy 
uh, between the north and the south. The north, many people have, uh, don't go to school in the north mm -hmm. because maybe they were uh, sending their, child, their children to the Muslim uh, schools. But in the south, there are many people who go to school. So usually when you speak about uh, civil societies, it is counterbalanced. You have more people from the south, more women from the south, who lead those uh, civil societies. And when you talk about, uh, even sometimes when you take, for example, the youth union or societies, there's a counterbalance because originally the northerners were much more in business, doing business. And they were the ones uh, that went to the, the south to set up their businesses in any kind of field and were the one who had money. So it's another kind of power. So that the former president was playing also on that because he made a kind of division between the different groups and said that, the, for example, stereotyping them that the Jula should stay doing business and shouldn't get involved in politics. That was a problem with uh, when Alassane emerged and nobody wanted to stand behind him because even Babu's ethnic group, stereotype, they're stereotyped to be people who like going and have fun. You know, they're only dealing with the cultural aspect of the country. They're singers, they're dancers, they're artists. And they shouldn't get involved in policy, politics. But if you look at, uh, for example, these two young people, uh, this is the book from uh, the Prime Minister, uh, Sorogio, who is a former student he was in the English department, and he was, and this book is from uh, uh, Blake Gooding, who is a youth leader uh, on the side of Babu. And he was like the prime minister of Babu's government. He was the one who had Babu's cell phone number and could have access to him in even times of crisis. He was the one organizing, uh, you know, uh, rallies and everything. And if you take, for example, these two, they, they were both in the uh, English department, and they were uh, the students of Babo, politically speaking. Babo trained them to lead the, the students, and this one stayed uh, at the university for 10 years without getting any degree. And uh, it's, it's different for, for uh, Sorogio. He graduated with his uh, BA and went to keep on uh, studying in Europe. So if you look at the, the you know, that, uh, I mean, uh, the way they, 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 they the background. Up, yeah, the background, the way they, they reached their position is completely uh, different, but almost the same, because Sorogion took, uh, is the one who was leading the rebels who were in the, in the north since 2002, and he remained there. It was a kind of a, a, a repartition, in fact. They divided the country into two. And so, uh, Blake Gude was in the, in, the, in the south with Babu. So he took weapons, he led the, the rebels, and he was uh, pretending to do the fight with empty, empty hands. So these are two people, young people, who came from the same uh, student union, the FACI, Fédération des étudiants élèves de Côte d'Ivoire. But believe me, they are more than, even worse than uh, any militia group. <laughs> they, they check our people IDs everywhere in front of soldiers. They kill people in front of anybody, even the, and they say, we are the ones who voted, who elected Babu, and nothing happened. And they vote, and they vote millionaires. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Sister Earl. I, I just want to, uh, I agree with you, um, there are two devils here. And we don't really know, um, but the key thing is um, the literacy um, percent, percentage in Ivory Coast is 49%. And mostly the northern people, uh, who are the one, the farmer workers, mm -hmm. the migrant workers, mm -hmm. They work so hard to sustain the economy of the country. And nothing is done to really try to educate them. 
And you actually sometimes see uh, kids that are forced to work in the farms because the family, they sometimes, they have to have the entire family work in the farm to, to be able to, make, to meet ends. Mm -hmm. But the key thing here with um, Alassane Watara is that since, because it was from the northern part, and uh, when Henri Konabedi was in power, he actually, uh, the one that created the diabolite, mm -hmm. the, the, that controversial law that excluded all the northern people from political participation. So what I think uh, should be done is um, the African Union and other international organization, they have to make sure there is transparency with, um, mm -hmm. within Alassane Water government. Mm -hmm. Somehow there should be a way to monitor, to make sure actually the people that put them to power are being served. And um, they're doing what is needed to um, improve the life of the people in the country. Sister Amber and Deborah Thank you very much for holding this forum, first of all. I think it's really important. Um, and I enjoyed all of the discussions. Um, I brought with me today. Um, by a representative from the African Union um, who served as a witness during the elections in Cote d'Ivoire. And I brought this because as I'm trying to educate myself about what's going on in Cote d'Ivoire, um, and I listen to um, the speeches given by Blake today, and I listen to the speeches um, given by um, um, President, former President Bagbo, it seems like they are, um, they believe that they have legitimate concerns as to whether or not there was election fraud. And so I began to sort of look into this deeper and I, I came up with this document. And I just wanted to read um, a couple of sections from it briefly because Wilson um, discussed um, the claims of election fraud and I think that this also helps to sort of give a face and the reality of the extent of what was going on. Um, so this was published by Joseph Kopu Kofigo, I believe, um, if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and this is what he says. The mission noted with regret serious acts of violence, namely losses of human lives, infringement of physical integrity, intimidations, and abduction attempts, and damage to electoral material. And then I, I have highlighted here some examples of what he talks about um, that went on in northern provinces. It is the fact that in the entire district of Korhogo, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, yes. Korogo. Yeah, Korogo, thank you. Serious cases of murders, death threats, intimidation, confinement, and physical assaults were perpetrated against LNP activists, which would be the party of Pro Bacbo, um, and representatives by the new forces and the air de air activists. For example, one of the LNP supervisors, Mrs. Koliba Siti was savagely beaten, then illegally detained before being murdered after denouncing the irregularities she reported during the poll processes in her area of duty. Another sad example, Mrs. Trahori Kadi, LMP supervisor, was disrobed, savagely beaten, publicly dragged off, then jailed. She was evacuated to the hospital where she is currently receiving care. Mr. Yo Khalifa, LMP activist residing in Midriyu, administrative subdivision of Mbengui, sorry, I'm not pronouncing these right, located 50 miles from Korhogo, died from the ruins he received from the new forces. Some of the acts of violence perpetrated during the polling processes <coughs> in Korhogo were recorded on videos from which the victims' testimonies are brought out. That includes several women who were raped, um, pro battle women who were raped um, in the northern provinces. And so I bring this up for two reasons. First, as we're talking about reconciliation, but we're not talking about these atrocities that were committed also in Dukwe, where um, representatives of Alassane Ouattara admitted that only 125 civilians were massacred, um, and they're not and he, they're now called, the international community is now calling for um, Alassane Ouattara to perform his own investigations into um, massacres that were recorded by um, the Red Cross. And so 
when we know that Abidjan, um, or the, the southern and the northern, that there's a divide. And when people are reading these sorts of documents and considering whether or not the democratic process was legitimate, how can we move towards reconciliation in Cote d'Ivoire? And then secondly, also, as an example for um, African democratic processes, could there have been a recount? Could this conflict have been avoided by a recount or a revote process? Yeah. Um, first of all, first of, um, absolutely, there were um, election irregularities, um, whether in pro Bagbo area or in pro Watara area. And that was acknowledged by all the other election observers. And I'm surprised that from what you read, you did not make mention, there is no mention of um, the irregularities that took place in uh, the stronghold. This was yeah. a report by somebody who was, this was a member of the um, witnesses who was situated. Absolutely, the absolutely. There were, there are, there are, there are pan Africanists, progressive pan Africanists within the AU, within the ECOWAS, within different governments in Africa that believe <coughs> that. Um, Bagbo is anti-imperialist, and before he's, because he's anti-imperialist, everything should swing towards his way. And I'm surprised, and you too should be surprised, that this observer is not talking about, um, 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 is not talking about the irregularities in pro Bagbo area. Okay, so so if, if this is, in the first place, one-sided. Then secondly, those that admitted that there were irregularities in pro Watara areas, uh, also admitted that if they were to count, take those ballots out of the entire ballot, take some of those ballots where they were egregious error, errors, take them out of the entire count, um, that it would not swing the elections the way that Bagbo took it when he, there was a way he took his, you know, supporters took it and they just took a whole bulk of Watara's votes vote out of the whole thing to swing it in that direction. Then thirdly, recount. Recount was not part of what Bagbo and his supporters were talking about when they uh, uh, used the constitutional uh, authority to swear in Bagbo. It was after they had sworn him, him in that they started talking about recount when they discovered that things were not going in their way. If they talked about recount before they sworn him in, then it would have been a different issue. So I think we, we really need to you know, take a nuanced approach to all these issues of um, electoral frauds and all that. It was a good question, though, but ours. Okay. Thank you. I saw himself as an African, and that if you go to his hometown in terms of national development, the Roman never developed his own hometown. I've been there. But he built roads, schools, everything for everyone to enjoy because he saw one country, and I believe that uh, at the time when Ghana was going to have this independence, there was a big struggle as to whether we were going to have a federal nation state or we were going to have one unitary system of government. And the majority of Ghanaians voted for one unitary system. And of course, we know that uh, when the government took power, uh, there were some abuses because there were some people who still believed that he was using the national resources to develop the entire country instead of allowing them to use the cocoa and the gold and the timber and the bauxite and everything else. But he believed in this ideology. So my question is that um, in post-independence Africa, in terms of leadership, why are we having leaders who still play to this idea of ethnicity? When in actual fact, when majority of the people, let's say 51% vote for you, is the whole nation that has voted for you. Therefore, you must create an ideology that will bring all people together and have a program that will develop the entire country equally, rather than still play on ethnicity as a basis of organizing and winning power. The second question I have has to do with the role of the African Union. The common warners that we should have an African high command, which would be able to deal with some of these problems that may come up. And I'm ashamed, and I want to apologize to my brothers and sisters from Africa, that my own government in Ghana, at the time when 
Ghana had a lot of respect and could have brought to bear upon Babo to understand the dire consequences of holding on to power. Uh, said that um, agriculture should mind its own business. Uh, no, Ghana should, should mind its own business in the sense that um, that is none of our business and therefore our brothers and sisters in the agriculture. When we have folks in agriculture who migrated from Ghana, they yeah, are people, speak my language, culture, everything, names, the same thing. So I think we abandoned our responsibility. And so my question is, the question of leadership, the visions of our leaders in creating this unified nation state for all of us. I believe that the people of Agricoast mm -hmm. did not vote for Al Hassan Wadra just to come and seek after the interests of the people of the North. Mm -hmm. They voted for him because they believe that he will be a good leader. Mm -hmm. And right off the bat, the country was divided. Even if it's 51 49 or 52 48. 48% of the folks didn't vote for you. And therefore, you must be wise as a leader of unifying the entire country. And my last question has to do with social justice. How can you have peace when you don't address the question of social justice? Because peace is not the absence of war. Peace is the presence of justice. And in Africa, we have allowed a lot of these things to pile up and pile up and pile up, and we don't want to deal with the question of social justice. We have this, well, let's forgive, let's forget, and then we move on. And then these things pile up and pile up. It's piled up in Ghana, it's piled up in many countries. We don't want to address the question of social justice. So for me, one way to bring about real reconciliation in, um, in agriculture is to address the question of social justice. And Watara has to address the question of social justice. And he has to be also held to the same standard in terms of what he did, killing people. Because on the road to assuming power, if you destroy people, what are you going to do when you assume the whole power? What else are you going to do? To my brother in, like, uh, in Libya, Gaddafi, much as he's against anti-colonialism, I think it is folly for one to say that I'm anti-colonialist, only to realize that you turn around and colonize your own people and suppress them. That is irreconcilable. And therefore, the African Union should understand that if Gaddafi says that he is anti-colonial, that's no excuse. And for some of the people who went and talked to Gaddafi, they themselves were people who had taken over power by force. And they had no legitimacy to go and plead on behalf of anybody to ask Gaddafi to give up power. They themselves took power from the people and they had no legitimacy. So there are all these things that are piled up on this continent. And yet we're talking about peace and reconciliation. I think we need to go deeper in understanding some of the things that we have overlooked for so many generations. You know, and uh, in my own family in Ghana, my dad told me the only car that he bought in his lifetime as a postmaster, that car was taken away from him because as an Ashanti, he was unfortunate to have met um, those who are from the convention post party who belonged to Kwame Koma, and they took away his only car. And you know, he had this bitterness in him until he died, and he passed on the story to me. But I realized that nothing was done even after Nkoma, and no justice ever happened. So how do we, overcome the compilation of these bitterness, these injustices that have remained with us and will continue to remain with us. And uh, external forces take advantage of that. Because if you ask yourself the question, the guns that these two forces were using, which countries produced the guns? They were not produced in the Arab coast. They were not produced on the continent of Africa. They were foreigners who sold them to us. But because these things already existed in terms of the enmity, we got the guns and we started fighting with each other instead of working together and fighting against the, the, the foreigner who is coming to exploit us. Good 
thank you for this question. I, I think the first one brought us on why African leaders play into ethnicity. It's obvious. It's for political reasons, for political gains. Um, that's why Gbagbo would, um, you know, exploit the differences in Cote d'Ivoire for himself to, to perpetuate himself in power, even though he had been there for ten years. Other than that, um, I don't think you know um, there are you know other uh, strong reasons it's for political reasons, not for the uh, help of the people. No. And the second question was uh, the role of the AU. I think the responsibility really lies on the African people to understand the importance of the, the importance of the AU as an institution for transformation, and that the African leaders are a stumbling block to the realization of the goals of the AU. So it's not up to the African people to work, to, to push the leaders to work, to realize their, the transformation uh, 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 goal of the AU, or push them out of the way. So that's why this very moment is very crucial in African history. Where we, we they, they pushed uh, Ben Ali out of the way, um, uh, Mubarak is gone. Gaddafi has to go. So maybe someday uh, uh, Zimbabwe's Mugabe will go. Sadiq is already on their feet now, pointing to the, what is going on in, in Egypt, saying now they're talking to Gaddafi, um, 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 Mugabe that what happened in Egypt could happen in Zimbabwe. So. If the African people can push these leaders out of the way and really make the AU to live up to its expectations, I think we would um, be talking about um, AU performing its uh, 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 role. Then social justice and peace, I think that still boils down to the leaders are stumbling block. So everything comes back to the people. If the people can push these leaders out of the way and do some um, strengthening democratic institutions. I think those will bring about social justice um, and, and other issues that we're talking about. Uh, we're going to take one more question. That will give us some time to give you refreshment. Brother Victor. Yes, sir. The ambassador. Well, the ambassador. <laughs> Thank you. Well, first of all, I think uh, we all have to thank God that uh, Brother Musa is back home, uh, back here safely. I remember he gave me a call about a month ago. He said, Victor, I just came from uh, Ivory Coast and I couldn't even see my parents. So I said, Ma, what is wrong with this guy, my brother? You went to Ivory Coast in this kind of situation? They say he had to go. Well, I think uh, while you went through, I'm going to organize a big church service for you, brother. <laughs> I promise you. I also want to share with you once. Uh, we're talking about Ivory Coast. Uh, just for a few minutes, about a company I work for that came from Ivory Coast. I think I'm going to write a book about this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll buy one. We're ready to go. Yes, sir. You know, about seven years ago, it was a big news around here. There was this company, supposedly, it was for the cooperative farmers of. Uh, Côte d'Ivoire, they're coming to buy nursing plant. I worked for nursing for 25 years. So I knew everybody that worked there. So I was one of the first people they hired. I mean, I could walk into the CEO office, the treasurer. I knew people from Africa, we all the same people, we all brothers. And what puzzled me was, we always we had meetings, they were supposed to bring cocoa beans from Ivory Coast. For four or five years, we never even saw a bag of cocoa beans for Ivory Coast. Meanwhile, the CEO had bought a house in Jamesville. The treasurer I left, met was drawing $250,000 a year for five years. I kept going to Walmart. I never even saw a candy bag being sold at lessons, at, at workmen's. My advice to you panel, any member of this panel, if you have any chance to talk to any member of the reconciliation, people in Ivory Coast, 
Don't forget about this company. There are some officers here that are still roaming. They have to come and pick them and jail them. Because I know there are some that are already in jail. Not they better come and pick the rest here. Please, thank you. Small quick point before we start having some refreshment. This question was posed to me by two people, so by the end, you can answer this question. What's the main difference between the Peace Council and the Peace Inc? Okay. Uh, Peace Incorporated is an organization which was started in the 1960s as part of the war on poverty that was initiated under President Lyndon Johnson. And it's primarily a, a sort of social service agency that offers uh, educational programming, so they have, often have food pantries and other sort of uh, programs to help people sort of personal uplift. So it's a much more individually focused kind of program as opposed to the Syracuse Peace Council, which is about changing the, the policies and the structures that impoverish people here in this country and around the world. So we certainly okay. uh, uh -huh. work on, on similar goals, but have no, a very no, different sort of uh, level at which we focus. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, All right, brother. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, you know, I don't speak English very good. I speak French, but... Go ahead. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Just that one issue. Pensez-vous qu'avec un pays, disant de... Avec une union armée, il faut y avoir des élections démocratiques. Dans un pays, un pays qui parle de... C'est ça ma question. Parce qu'il devait y avoir... Is it possible in a country that's divided into to have democratic elections? And, and, and the, second, the, second, the second point is, il devait y avoir le désarmement. Par contre, il fallait désarmer les rebelles qui étaient du Nord pour qu'il y ait en fait des élections transparentes dans le pays. Ce qui n'a pas été le So, how is it that we can have elections democratic in the right conditions? We can have problems. Because we have to arrange this problem before we go to the elections. That's why the elections were reported several times. So, the reason that there was no disarmament that's the reason why the elections were continually postponed. Yeah, because we all, people have always argued that by we have stayed in power for 10 years. You don't want to leave the power. No, that is not, that is not true. For the power for five years and they were they were making an arrangement in Ouagadougou for disarmament, to put, the, to put the gun down before going to the election. Nobody ever agreed to go to disarmament before going to the election. That's why all this problem happened over there. They need to put the gun down before doing anything. The other way, we're not going to have a democratic election in the country. That's not possible. So, I, I, didn't, I didn't know you spoke French, so I remember. Next time we speak in French. Thank you. I just wanted to say that, in fact, uh, Bravo is a very good politician. He knows very well about all these problems. He decided that, uh, even though those problems existed, to go to the elections. And he, to safeguard the election, he decided to nominate people who could, you know, control the ballots and everything. And there were some people on his side and some people on the other side. And what, what I'd like to tell you is that normally uh, Babu was misled by the previous uh, four, uh, let's question it, uh, so that, yeah. The yeah, no, I mean the sondage. Uh, the, you understand what I mean? Yeah, that's I mean, But because this company gave him, uh, said that it was going to win the election. It was going to beat the, all the candidates, for sure. And then, the first round, he won. So there wasn't any problem. But for the second round, he sent his soldiers to the north of the country. And they agreed to go there in, in, in great number. And the thing is that he never thought that Bédier was going to, you know, get together with Al-Assad. That was the biggest mistake. Because usually in the past, they used to say all against Ouattara. And 
Ouattara used to stand with Babo before to go for the election. But they played a trick on him and isolated him. You understand? Yeah. So the very last moment, he believed that the Baoli people who are Christians were going to stand with him rather than to stand with the Muslim. But surprisingly, it happened. That's where Babu lost. And then he didn't want to believe. But that doesn't answer the question yeah. about the. No, it's the same thing because, in fact, people. Does the African Union have that responsibility or why? Yeah, to design. Maybe the UN, uh, the UN nation have a responsibility to design. Everybody to design. You design know what? The, nation. the UN nation never said anything about it. Nobody never said anything about it. And they, they forced them to go to the election with the country divided in two. Yeah. But, but yeah. they have to be right. the country because. There's no, no, there's no way to get it. The you know, the nation where they were both on this side and the other side. That's true. That's true. But you know what? What was in, in, not in favor of Babo? His background. Because he's been misleading people forever and ever. That's what plays played against him. To tell you the truth, that's the only problem. No, we're not no, 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 no. Yeah, I understand. You know what? I had my scholarship under Babo. I had the chance to work at the Portland Chocolate Plant under Babo. Every good thing that happened to my life happened under Babo. You understand? And I have my uncle, my, my cousin, who is his first vice president, Abdraman Sangari. You understand? Mm -hmm. And he was arrested with him in his, in his bunker with his mom and his sisters. But that's to tell you that we all involved in this problem. Mm -hmm. But we can't, you know, let somebody kill people to remain in power. Because even though Alassane is killing people, but he's trying to set them a little bit free so that we can have a normal life. People have been inside, locked up in their houses for almost, 20, almost one month. And they were running short of food and everything. No medicine, and you see. That's why I am telling Doris right now in Africa, it's the same thing too. Yeah, but that's true. We have to pray so that these kind of things have to stop. You know, it's 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 the, the situation. The situation. Doctor Mugo hit on it. Yep. She really did elaborate, and no one at the time really talked about it. She talked about the IMF and the World Bank. It's all about money. True. Everybody's looked upon in Africa as a commodity. 1% of the population that controls this world uses leaders like Babo as puppets. Mm -hmm. He's nothing but a puppet being played by the puppeteer. So we can get caught up in the spin because you can't, you, you can't, you can't beat the spin. You know what I mean when I say the spin? Mm -hmm. You know, you, fast. Yeah. rhetoric. Mm -hmm. You get caught up in the spin of rhetoric. The real. We know that we, we know the symptoms. We're talking about it today, but what is the real problem? That's what has to be attacked. The people that control the purse strings that control the countries on the continent of Africa that got because there's three billion people in this world today. Two billion of them are living on two dollars a day. One billion is living on one dollar a day. And in Africa, the majority of those people are some of them even less living less than a dollar a day. Don't even, can't even get educated. Then you get the educated people in these different countries, and what do they do? They mislead the people and sell them out because they want the money. So the real deal is the people has to rise up, rise up. Because they say if the, if the basic needs of the people of any society are not met, the people will bound to break the laws or rise up. And that's what's happening in the world today. Thanks, Mayor James. Thanks so much. We're half an hour beyond the time. It's time to have some refreshment. I'll suggest just pack some stuff with you. Again, I want to thank the panel for coming. Thanks so much. Help yourself with some flyers. With some flyers in the back. Please write your name or sign your name for the topic.